I say the common currency is dopamine, what I mean is the molecule dopamine, when secreted in the brain, makes us pursue things, build things, create things, makes us want new things that we don't currently already have. Within the expansive sphere of influential thinkers, there are a select few whose insights not only expand our knowledge, but also alter our fundamental understanding of life. These insights penetrate deeply into our shared consciousnesses, resulting in a profound internal transformation. Recent discourse on personal responsibility serves as a potent illustration of this transformative capacity. This is not simply advice to take charge of someone's life, it's, it's an emphatic call to action, a rallying cry for individual agency and self-governance. You know, in terms of value of understanding the nervous system and where it can be steered, it's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response to uh -huh. experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself uh, in order to be in concert with its surroundings and to optimize that just the, the way we described a minute like ago. Like the way that I mean, a child can learn a language very quickly or, or three languages. play the guitar or something like yeah, that. Yeah, without an accent, you know, right. three languages without an accent. It's remarkable. You try and do that after age 25, it's very challenging. And so, the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of, your, of its life. The message is primed to instigate a seismic shift in our individual and collective consciousness for the weeks to come. We are not just poised on the brink of a new perspective, but we are standing at the threshold of a new era of self-responsibility and ownership. In a rapidly polarizing world, the steadfast commitment to the principle of free speech emerges as a beacon of hope right? A recent discourse underscores this commitment, spotlighting the paramount importance of open dialogue for our society's overall health and cohesion. Instead of fanning the flames of division and discord, it encourages us to chart a course towards unity through mutual understanding. And so the brain can change in adulthood, and it can change provided that there's an emphasis on some perceptual event. So in other words, if you want to change your brain as an adult, Let's say you want to be less anxious. You want to learn a new language. You want to be more functional in some way, presumably. The key thing is to bring focus to some particular perception of something that's happening during the learning process. And the reason for that is that there's a neurochemical system involving acetylcholine. And it comes from these two little nuclei down in the base of the brain called nucleus basalis. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior, and it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. So for people that wanna change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point and the ability to access deep rest and sleep. Mm. Because most people don't realize this, but neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus but neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest. And we can talk about how to optimize those different brain functions. One of the things that's really important also to think about how the brain works in terms of plasticity and all this stuff is what the brain really wants to do is also pass as much of what it does off to reflexive behavior as possible. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> yeah. so when we're talking about focus, I think it can get a little bit vague but it might be useful to think about like what exactly is focus and what triggers plasticity. So the brain loves to be able to just do things, pick up. This alternative to the current narrative is not just refreshing, it's just transformative, holding the potential to deeply affect our social fabric in the weeks ahead. The conversation surrounding the role of truth in our lives is enlightening. The most recent dialogue serves as a powerful reminder that truth is not a mere abstract concept, it's an indispensable tool for personal growth and societal evolution. This message, laden with profound implications, is primed to echo through the corridors of our society in the upcoming weeks, offering a fresh, invigorating perspective on our relationships with truth. We find ourselves at the precipice of a new understanding of truth that invites us to engage more deeply and meaningfully with ourselves and our surroundings. Coffee cups and drink and walk and talk and do things and not put much energy into it. When we decide to focus, what the brain really does is it switches on a set of circuits that involve the frontal cortex and nucleus basalis and some others, and it's trying to understand duration, how long something's gonna last, path, what's gonna happen, 
and outcome, what ultimately is gonna happen. So duration, path, and outcome. You know, the, the events of early 2020 are a good example of this. One of the reasons why it's so exhausting to be alive in 2020 is because we are now having to pay attention to duration, path, and outcome. How long is this thing gonna last? When are, you know, when are they gonna open up all businesses? Did I touch that door handle? Does it matter? You know, right. who are the experts? Are there any experts? You know, there are a lot of questions, whereas normally we can just move through life without having to do all that analysis. Mm. The exploration of the human psyche surpasses the conventional boundaries of psychology, voyaging into the vast and largely uncharted territories of the subconscious. In a recent discourse, we're challenged to confront our inner demons, to embark on a profound journey of introspection and self-discovery. This audacious approach to understanding the self is primed to ignite a wave of internal exploration in the weeks ahead. It promises to shift our perception of self, fostering a deeper, more nuanced understanding of our motivations, fears, and desires. The delicate equilibrium between order and chaos offers a unique perspective on societal dynamics. The latest conversation serves as a call to arms for moderation, a warning against the inherent dangers of extreme ideologies that often dominate our societal discourse. This profound message is more than just a wake-up call. It's a plea for balance, for moderation that will resonate within all of us in the coming weeks. This is an alternative that not only challenges the existing status quo, but also provides a roadmap for a more balanced, harmonious, and inclusive society. Let's talk about the effects of testosterone and DHT in the brain. The main effect of these androgens in the brain is to make effort feel good. Because of the way that testosterone and DHT bind to receptors and activate certain components of the amygdala. We always think of the amygdala as a fear center, but it's a threat detection center and it has a lot of different parts, including parts that allow you to be forward center of mass in response to pressure. So am I suggesting people take exogenous testosterone? No, that's a personal choice that people can explore on their own if they wanna do that. But if you've been pushing, pushing, pushing and winning, winning, or just pushing really hard and then you've experienced that crash, a lot of people need some time to recover in order to be able to come back and be able to work hard again. But here's what's really interesting. Not only does testosterone make effort feel good, effort increases testosterone. So this is the athlete or the student who's like, I don't wanna do it, I don't wanna do anything. Getting into some degree of forward center of mass. Mm -hmm. I always say, I think I picked this up from a team guy, it's very mm -hmm. team guy language. You can either be back on your heels, right. flat footed or forward center of mass on anything. Mm -hmm. Getting into that forward center of mass mental orientation can start to trigger some of the pathways related to these hormones and these neuromodulators. What you don't want to do is start using a lot of exogenous factors, caffeine, or a lot of things outside of you in order to try and create those states because then you're gonna further deplete your dopamine and so on. When, I think you went on Rogan at one point and I overheard a portion, I listened to a portion of the conversation where you said you had um, been working really hard and then you went on vacation and then you got sick. Yeah, yeah. So this is interesting. That's the autonomic nervous That's system. That's happened to me like m numerous times. Okay, so, so there's a very clear explanation for, for that and a very simple remedy. Although it's not obvious, which is why many people experience this. Many people experience studying for finals and then it ends getting sick. Taking care of a loved one, round the clock, the person either gets better or sometimes dies or whatever it is, and then the caretaker gets sick. Why is that? Well, we always hear that stress compromises the immune system. Nothing could be further from the truth. Stress activates the immune system. Think about it. How would your immune system, your spleen and your other immune organs of the body know when it's under pressure? Well, you could have some foreign bacteria or virus in your body, but when you are in a mode of go, 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 the molecule adrenaline triggers the release of killer B cells and T cells from the spleen. It's when you relax. Now you need to get your sleep, but it's when you finally experience that symmetric swing back of the seesaw. So you're go, 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 boom. And then you completely relax and you're hanging out with me and all of a sudden you get the sniffle and the rest of the thing. This is, there's a beautiful study done by, that was done in response to none other than Wim Hof, believe it or not, there's a really beautiful quality scientific study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where they had two groups of people. One group meditated, the other group did Wim Hof type breathing. So what we call in the laboratory cyclic hyperventilation. So inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale 25 times. Forceful inhales and forceful exhales. Then hold your breath, lungs empty for 15 seconds, repeat for about three rounds. What does that do? Why do you heat up adrenaline? It's such a generic thing, it's adrenaline. You could have gotten into an ice bath, adrenaline. You could have someone shout in your face, 
adrenaline. It's just adrenaline. What, what did they do? They injected both groups of people with E. coli, injected them with E. coli. One group gets nauseous, vomiting, and feels sick. The group that does this cyclic hyperventilation, Wim Hof, also called tumotype breathing, far fewer symptoms, if any, including lack of fever. So why? Well, they were able to combat the, the attack of this bacteria. So if you're coming off of a hard bout of work and you're starting to relax into vacation, you would be wise to still get into some cold water. You would be wise to still do some cyclic hyperventilation breathing. Certainly don't do those at the same time. A number of people actually have died doing cyclic hyperventilation and then doing breath holds because when you exhale a lot of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is the trigger to breathe. This is really important. If, if you do hyperventilation, <sighs> and then you hold your breath, you can do a much longer breath hold than you could if you just Markeely or somebody like that who really understands that. What happens is you're swimming along, you're like, wow, I can really hold my breath down here a long time. Lights out. And actually, I'm aware of a few people in the military community who, who've dabbled with Wim Hof tumotype breathing and have died and not, it's not good. I yeah, think it's, it's not allowed, basically. It's not certainly not encouraged from what I understand. So do it on land away from water. And the idea here is that Adrenaline protects us. You don't want it cascading out of control so that you can't sleep. You want to use things like non-sleep deep rest and the appropriate timing of light and exercise, et cetera, to be able to sleep well at night to reset all these systems. But if you go too quickly from go, 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 go to complete relaxation, your immune system, your defense system will crash too. And so you're not gonna be able to fight off even the, even the smallest or the, you know, the pettiest of viruses and bacteria. That's when you get the sniffle, you get sick. You're like, I'm finally resting, what's going on? So you can taper out of those high intensity phases. There are actually you know, guys in the teams other now that I think are aware of this and are starting to think about this and for various effects. But in the mind, testosterone makes effort feel good. Adrenaline puts us into a mode of readiness. Dopamine puts us into a mode of motivation. And then there's the mirror side of all this, which are the neurochemicals that broadly defined promote relaxation and parasympathetic activation. And those come under the names that you probably heard them before, like serotonin, oxytocin, and the hormone prolactin. Serotonin and oxytocin are molecules that make us feel good, make us feel soothed, not in response to things that we're motivated to go get, but in response to what we already have. So this might sound a little woo, but you know, if you sit there and do a gratitude practice, or you hang out with your dog and your kids, or you eat a meal, right? You're nourishing yourself with food that you are not in the process of having to kill first. You're just really in, you know, Thanksgiving, um, a, a few moments of, of appreciation, simple things. The feel good that you experience, the love and kindness meditations, these mm. kinds of things, we know based on neuroimaging studies and blood draws and things of that sort, promote the release of things like serotonin and oxytocin. That nature has designed beautiful systems of pursuit and pleasure that are designed to oscillate and designed to keep us in pursuit and pleasure cycles. In relationships, typically the dopamine phase is the early phase. Simultaneously in these cycles? Oftentimes not simultaneously. Typically dopamine and serotonin are released. Always, there's always some floating around in our system at any moment, but typically dopamine and adrenaline are associated with pursuit of things that are outside the confines of our immediate possession in our skin. And serotonin is more about the things that we have, the things, you know, get seeing your kid, holding your kid, that promotes the release of oxytocin and serotonin. It feels amazing, mm -hmm. right? These are the molecules that led to our evolution as a species. So I'm not diminishing one or the other, but they need to oscillate, right? An early relationship, there are times when people aren't sleeping very much. It's like a mental illness. It's like a, it's a form of mania. You're so excited, you don't need sleep, right? People are able to, to do all sorts of things at frequency and intensity that they find themselves two years later in a relationship and they love the person. It's very warm and cozy, but well, unless they're going off on deployments and coming back, they don't have that reset of the, of the system. So, you know, the ability to miss somebody, reset that pursuit and desire system. These are powerful systems and they don't just pertain to romantic relationships. This is also school. I always, you know, I always did summer school because I had to do a lot of catching up to do based on the, you know, a lot of catching up. But, you know, there's some value in taking a week off and realizing you are truly resetting all the systems for pursuit. And I hear from a lot of hard driving folks who are like, wow, once I understood dopamine, I realized why I'm so burnt out. People think of adrenal burnout. Guess what? There's no actual medical term, adrenal burnout. There's adrenal insufficiency syndrome. 
that's a rare syndrome, but you have enough adrenaline packed away in your brain and body to for three lifetimes. Think about what people used to go through. I mean, you talk about some of this on your podcast, you see the images of people and you read the stories, you're like, you can make it through finals, kids. <laughs> so the, what happens though, is we're in such modes of pursuit and overthinking and overthinking. We need to learn how to switch back and forth on a regular basis, what I call deliberate decompression or non-sleep deep rest. Have a practice each day of 10 to 30 minutes where you're not on your phone and you're in kind of a wordless state. You're just either yoga nidra or you're just relaxing or not watching anything, not taking in any sensory information, not meditating not journaling, just in a state of just trying to blank your mind and just watch how much stronger you come back in terms of your ability to focus and your motivation. That's one, I love the phone and social media has been very good to me and I appreciate many of its features. But one of the problems is, is we tend to fill our idle time with more sensory information and that doesn't allow us to go into this deliberate decompression. It doesn't allow us to you remember, I cut myself off, but a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, a movie is worth a million pictures. Now I can scroll through millions of movies very quickly. And so the dopamine system is just a little bit overwhelmed. I don't think we need to be off our phones all the time. We just take some time to just deliberately decompress each day, any time of day, so, and you'll focus better. So you're getting hit with that dopamine on, on Instagram. So at first you are, but here's how you know dopamine and it's this will give you a window into addiction if you're if you're not an addict you'll be able to sympathize with maybe even empathize with addicts of various kinds when you first get on social media you're excited maybe you or joe or somebody has a new podcast out right you know you're excited oh i can't wait to hear this. that's dopamine you're motivated but if you ever find yourself doing a behavior and you kind of don't know why you're doing it you're sort of like that like hey your heart's not it like what why am i here why am i what am i doing i'm not even getting any pleasure but here i am like a you know rat pressing a lever. Well, that's the dopamine system has been depleted. And so what you need is some time away from it. Could be 10 minutes, could be 10 days. And then it feels good again. True for relationships, true for exercise. You know, I believe in training hard and training often, but if you train too hard too often, you can't bring the intensity that you need to get the stimulus to adapt and pretty soon you're either plateauing or you're getting worse. The repetition range can be pretty broad. You think anywhere from six to 30 repetitions. You should do 10 sets per muscle group per week, maybe even a bit more. So high volume. High volume, but you have to go to failure or beyond in order to stimulate growth. Why does it work at such a great range of repetitions? Well, there apparently are three ways that you stimulate hypertrophy and maybe more. One is tissue micro damage to the tissue. The other is through some sort of tension-based changes in the molecular gene programs of cells that lead to protein synthesis that don't that are distinct from damage. And the other are metabolic effects of like high repetition work of superfusion of the muscle with blood. We know that third category exists because people are now doing this blood restriction training where they cuff off a muscle and they'll use a really light weight. I've done these before. You can use a five pound weight and do curls with this and you're, you are in pain and the muscles are swelling up with blood. It does lead to hypertrophy, but in general, you're not sore. You're not doing tissue damage. And by the way, don't just turn to get it off a muscle because you have to use the proper cuffs um, because you need the blood still to flow in one direction. You can't just cinch it off or you'll, you'll potentially kill yourself if you um, get a clot or you do it wrong. So get the appropriate cuffs, they're out there. And then for endurance, I learned something really cool. So I, I work out basically, I go to the gym every other day on average, I, three or four days a week I do that, but generally not two days in a row. It's workout, next day I'll do cardio, next day. And the cardio for me is always a 30 to 45 minute jog, kind of zone two cardio. Andy informed me that to build endurance while building strength and maintaining some muscle size, or even building muscle size, 